You're listening to The Secrets of Star Trek, where we discuss the hidden layers and deeper meanings found in all the Star Trek TV, series, movies, and more. And today we're discussing the penultimate episode of Season 3 of Star Trek Picard called Vox. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today on the panel is Father Corey Stika. Hey, Father. How's it going? How's it going? Very good, thanks. Uh, folks, yeah, Jimmy's not able to join us this time, but uh, Father Corey and I will hold down the fort. And uh, I want to remind you all to remember to like The Secrets of Star Trek wherever you find us on social media, like on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash StarQuest Media, or on Twitter where we're at SQPN. We're also on Instagram at StarQuest Network. And be sure to leave us comments wherever you find us online. We love to hear from you. Uh, I want to tell you about another show on the StarQuest Network you are sure to enjoy called Let's Science. You can find that wherever fine podcasts are found or at sqpn.com slash science. And finally, be sure to stick around to the end because we have more of your awesome listener feedback that we'd love to share and discuss. Uh, I, I do want to say that uh, you folks are on top of feedback. You are sending <laughs> feedback the morning that the, the latest episode drops, which I have to remember to be careful about because sometimes there's spoilers in your... <laughs> Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I did get one uh, one plot point to the spoiled on me by accidentally looking at the wrong email uh, on Which, Thursday morning. I mean, but, that, yeah. that's, a, that's a great problem to have. Keep it up. Oh, you yeah. Know, but it, we it, love it, to get your feedback. Yeah. And it, it shows how much people have really enjoyed Picard season three. We talked about that at length last episode, but it really showed yeah. how much people have enjoyed this season. Most definitely. All right, uh, time for the plot summary. Let's recap what goes on in episode nine of Vox. G picking up from last time, Jack lets Deanna Troy open the red door in his mind, and she sees it's the Borg on the other side. Without telling Jack what she saw, she runs to tell Picard and Beverly that, that and they, dis they discover, realize, or deduce that Jack was born with organic Borg implants passed on to him by Picard slash Locutus that was misdiagnosed as Eremotic Syndrome. Picard then tells Jack what's going on and wants him to go to this Vulcan institution to be essentially lobotomized, yeah. as Jack puts it. So Jack takes control of some security officers and leaves the ship in search of the Borg to confront them. Jordy and Data realize that not only is Jack a kind of Borg transmitter, but the changelings have infected Starfleet's transporters with code that implants the DNA in every person who uses them, this special Borg DNA. And it will, but it will turn out that only those, presumably the humans, we'll, let's get back to that, under the age of 25 can be assimilated this way. Picard has Shaw take them to Earth for Frontier Day, where Starfleet is about to demonstrate the Borg Light fleet synchronization system. Meanwhile, Jack has found the Borg and the Borg Queen, who jacks into his neck, sorry, and assimilates mm. him, then sends out a powerful signal which activates the Borg assimilation throughout the fleet. The assimilated Starfleet uh, uh, crew start killing the unassimilated ones. Shaw takes the TNG crew to a mate and shuttle to get off the Titan, but is killed while covering their escape. That's the spoiled bit for me, but not before passing on command to Seven. Picard and crew head to the Fleet Museum at Athen Prime, where Geordi reveals the project he's been working along all along on in Hangar 12. It's the Enterprise D, and our crew is reunited with their old ship once again. Mm. So, the end. Yes. So, a um, couple things to say up front. I guess we're not getting a Shaw spinoff series. No, no. But, but you know, again, the old, old principle of nobody, no... I mean, it looks pretty dead. He looked pretty dead. I mean, yeah, he could be mostly open. dead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I, yeah. I, I, I think they're done with, which is disappointing. However, I mean, he went out very well. I mean, he went out as a hero. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I think he got his redemption there. He calls her seven before the end, yep. um, and gives her his ship in command. So. And yeah, someone I think pointed out online that they, he called her seven on the ninth episode. <laughs> seven of nine <laughs> nice <laughs> uh another thing i noticed they put an accent over the o in the title for vox yeah i, uh, I don't that's know not, the little tilde like you would see yeah the enya in spanish and i don't know why they made that choice because it in vox in latin is vox there's no there's no yeah. symbol in latin 
Uh, by the way, they do hang a lantern on the Borg use of Latin, but we will get to that because there's several yep. things to talk about with regard to that. One, yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's get into it because there's a lot to talk about here. Uh, Troy, Troy starts by telling uh, Jack, you know, there's nothing more elusive than a door that the mind does not wish to open. I like that line. That's a pretty, pretty good line. It, it's that avoidance of unpleasantness that we have naturally in exactly. us. Exactly. That, that, that where we can kind of, kind of, put out put out of our mind anything that's difficult that's painful that we you know we can negotiate it away we can do whatever you know anything but actually deal with it right right um then we have this jazz song playing that we heard at the beginning in the first episode Mm -hmm. when we first saw beverly ship um it's the can't stop crying over you i think is the title of the uh, at least one of the lyrics anyway um i'm not quite sure it, it, what it means other than it's connected to Beverly's nostalgia for Picard. So, yeah, um, it's, well, it was a song that Picard introduced her to, you know, put on her mix. Right. And, okay. uh, and, and she would play it a lot. Okay. And so, and so it's as much a connection f- between Picard and Beverly as between the two of them and Jack. Okay. And that's presumably why Jack is hearing that in whatever his vision is, is mm-hmm. uh, that, that he has this connection to Picard. Um, and we also get an explanation for the branching red branching stuff. Um, it comes from a visit that Jack and Beverly made when he was a kid to the Crimson Arboretum on Raritan four, uh, Mm -hmm. where these particular plants, um, these flowers beneath the, 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 the earth, the ground, they're all connected. The, the right. roots are all connected. And so um, beneath the soil, the vines are connected. And so uh, th- this it implies the connection that he craves with the Borg. Um, right. It is right and true and pers- purposeful and perfect that they would be connected is, is how and he puts it. And they even show them, you know, like supposedly under the ground and they look like synapses, which, which toy uh, neurons, excuse me, neurons. And where Troy yeah. even kind of says this, you know, these look like they're neurons, you know, she calls that right. Out, so. Part of a hive mind in that sense. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's interesting how Jack told Picard earlier, he doesn't, he's not looking for connection. He's not interested in making connection, but of course it, it turns out he really has been, it's been the, yes. something inside him all along from ch- you know childhood, this craving of a connection. And it turns out like the connection to the Borg. So, um, Deanna opens the door and we see, we don't see what she sees for at first. We just sees, we just see her horrified expression, which is, which was pretty good. Well, actually and the then, first time we see it, it's, she opens the door and we see her from behind and you see the lights kind of poking out, you know, the board like lights right. poking out. And then it shows us her expression later and what she saw. Now let's talk about the Borg showing up here. You know, in the end, I mean, uh, all credit goes to those who predicted that the Borg would be the big bats. I, I, all credit yeah. goes to that. Some folks expressed some disappointment. They were hoping it would be the Pa Wraith and uh, the changelings. And I, in retrospect, it had to be the Borg in the end, mm-hmm. after all. And it, for the final, what's presumably the final season of a, a, a Star Trek Picard, focusing on Jean-Luc Picard, you had to have the final confrontation between Picard and the Borg. There just had to be, right? Yeah, and, and I admit there was, by and large, I really enjoyed this episode. I mean, this was a great episode. But there were yeah. two things that just mildly disappointed me, and one of them was the Borg. The fact that right. the big bads were the Borg. And they did, they will answer later how the Borg, could, or how Jack, through the Borg, could control other people. And yes. hear the voices of other people. So they do answer that question, because that's the question we came up with earlier when we were talking about, you know, who is the big bad. Um, right. But it still was disappointing. I mean, we see a lot of the Borg in recent <laughs> shows, but it does explain right. why the theme music at the end, the closing credits music is the first contact closing credits music, <laughs> how there's, you know, right. things about the Borg kind of interspersed. Uh, there was a video by uh, the YouTuber Major Grin, where he's got, you know, he does a lot of really interesting editing and stuff. And he's put everything in Picard up to season, episode eight that showed that, the Borg, 
you know, that right. was explicit. And it's, and I, I even posted it to, I think, Discord and said, I really hope this isn't it. <laughs> it is. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. It, I, I'm not, I'm not like so much disappointed. Uh, I guess I just felt like it was inevitable, but I agree. We've seen so much of the Borg last season, this season. Mm-hmm. Um, and we, we need to talk about that in a second. Um, yes. But I'm, I think I'm okay with it. I just, I mean, I see the inevitability, but it just feels like we've been over this ground so many times. The Borg assimilating everything, the yeah. Borg assimilating everything. And uh, I kind of was hoping for something new, but I understand it as well. See, I would have liked uh, it if they would have kept it with the changelings and that it was something the changelings had worked on. Because now yeah. you notice the changelings are gone. They're just mentioned of, oh, yeah, they've been working with the Borg. So we don't care about the changelings anymore. The Borg's the real right. threat. They were a means to an end in yep. it all. Yeah. And some folks were like, oh, we would, you know, the PA race. I was hoping to see Cisco. I'm like, yeah, but I mean, come on. That's DS9. That's a DS9 story. That's not a, right. a, a TNG story. And it had to be a TNG story. So yeah. I guess I, I, I see that, too. I mean, I think the, t- the changelings were also a DS9 foe. So that may be why you'd be thinking that. Um, but and what it tells me is that we need a, a, a DS nine series. <laughs> no, but of course, <laughs> but of course. Um, so we get this um, from Beverly that some transceivers and receivers can be organic. We, we have this reference to how like birds, like starlings in flight, like a murmuration of starlings all can wheel and turn without any audible communication. They're communicating somehow between each other and other species can do that. So there's, there's a real, you know, some kind of connection. Um, and that's perhaps there's an organic transceiver inside of Jack. Mm-hmm. Okay. I'll buy that. And that, that also explains why Picard has all along, even, you know, once he yes. had his Borg implants taken out, has still continued to hear the Borg in his head. Well, um, that was, that that's was a nice explanation. That, that's something they put into first contact, but really never discussed how he could do it. Yeah. How could he have that connection with the Borg, even though he had no, nanoprobes he had none of that right right so it's again once again terry metallis mining the trek lore closing loops you know yeah. doing all that so that's really that was really good um and, but okay okay, okay. I, was gonna say, I was going and, and, to you know, i was gonna say just talking about the fact that they basically planted a dna time bomb yes in, yeah that went on to jack right right um and so and kind of retcons the aromatic syndrome of the last two seasons oh, and the best of both worlds because let's to be honest yeah. that came from the tng itself the right. the finale but um yeah it kind of undoes that which and it also kind of i don't know does it change how i feel about picard's death i mean in a way it almost like his the the death of his body in season two yes. um it almost feels, was that season two? Season one. Yeah. Season one. Right. Um, it almost feels like Metallus's commentary on that. Like we shouldn't have done that. I, you know, I, I get the feeling he kind of agrees with a lot of fans that season one and two, while they had their, their merits are, were not what we wanted. What a lot of fans <laughs> right. wanted. We wanted what we've gotten in season three. The TNG yes. crew back together. I mean, this is TNG episode or yeah. season eight. I mean, that's really what this is. In space in the 25th century, not running around 21st century Los Angeles, which exactly. You know. uh, all right. Let's get to the, the big retcon here or possible retcon, which is I've heard the one thing I've heard most <laughs> since this episode aired. Beverly says the Borg haven't been seen in over a decade. Oh, yes. And. And everyone says, uh, we saw them last season at the end with, uh, <laughs> yeah. And with Agnes Gerardi and you know, what about those Borg and queen? Yep. Uh, I didn't go back and rewatch or the end of that, or is it a separate hive? Are they somehow different, you know, separate? We shouldn't consider them to be real Borg. Do they, is it because they came from another time? What, what do you think? Yeah. I, I think that it is a different hive. You know, it, it is a different collective and they are watching that rift or whatever they were, you know, I can't remember exactly how they put it, but basically they were going to stand yeah. guard over that rift that was, you know, subspace, whatever, what, you know, the, the techno babble rift that they have. Um, right. 
And so, and it's possible too, of course, there's always the, you know, well, this is top secret and she wasn't in Starfleet anymore. So she never heard about it. Yeah, I guess. Uh, I mean, although it's a prominent line to throw out there, you wouldn't even have to throw out there. And you'd think that they would wonder. And now it could be that in episode 10, the finale, they'll come right out and and say something about it. Uh, they just well, didn't in, have the time in this one. Someone pointed out that um, there was a reference in episode three where Shaw talks about, you know, we, we aren't going to have any good Borg coming out, coming to help us or something like that. Right, 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 right. Yeah, that's true. You know, oh. by the way, you also reminded me, just now reminding me that the end of season two, they were setting up season three, weren't they? With that rift, like there was supposed to be something having to do with this rift. And there's another problem that's potentially related to this. So either yeah. that rift is going to end up being brought up in season episode 10, which seems weird to bring it up uh. at the, such a last second, or we just threw that out. Yeah. And I, I hate to say it. There's a lot of things in season three that feels like season one, two or be just thrown out. I mean, there yeah. really are. I mean, it just, it feels to me that it's just, we're forgetting about all this. I, you know. I, I mean the, the completionist or the, uh, the, you know, the continuity, uh, uh, uh completionist in me br bristles a bit at that, but on the other hand, I'm okay with it. <laughs> but if they do, a, if they do a future episode, if they do Star Trek legacy, like keeps getting rumored yeah. seven of nine as captain of the Titan, there's a plot line they could follow there. Now, by the way, now we know why all the rumors about a Star Trek legacy with seven as captain were out there. These people knew that Shaw died. Yeah. So, um, which well, frankly leads me to believe that there's more to those rumors and ideas than I'd previously given credit to. Yeah. Well, and of course there, there were um, YouTubers that got to see the entire season before it right. started airing. And so those were right. the ones that were kind of leaking out some of these ideas. And then you get a couple others that, that are supposedly have actual connections with Hollywood. They're not just, you know, spitballing things like we do, you know, but they have yeah. actual connections to Hollywood that are saying, yeah, this mm. is a legitimate rumor, you know, that there could, this could happen. I, I'd love to see it. I, I, we, we've introduced some interesting characters and, and interesting things. So I'd, I'd love to see it. Yep. So, um, all right. So Troy is right. Jack is now dangerous and should be treated as such. Um, he's a, he's a Borg that feels and cares and thinks independent thoughts, uh, which is well, interesting. Is he actually fully a Borg yet? And that, that's one of the questions he asks is, you know, so I've had this desire. I've known that things are wrong in the world and that if people could just listen to each other and, you know, that sounds fine and see each other for who they are. And that sounds fine. And have one mind and one thought, one collective. And it's just like, oops, you know, <laughs> it, even he goes yeah. and he says, how much of that was me? How much of what I am is me? Mm. And I think what they're setting up, and again, this is trying to guess what's going to happen in the next episode, because they've only got about an hour. Let's give or take <laughs> to wrap yeah. all this up. He's going to be how the Borg get undermined. Yes. He's going to be how the Borg get stopped. Right. And he, he makes it explicit. That's what he's doing. He's going to find the Borg to show the queen who he is. Right. It, it is interesting, by the way, that that speech he gives about, you know, I've always thought that people can only, you know, think one thought and it's kind of the whole, uh, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Yep. Like if only we could take away everyone's free will, everything would be perfect. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, and, uh, no, not really. Um, and uh, yeah, it is interesting to think because in the next episode, we not only have to have the defeat of the Borg, but we also have to have the wrap up, the postscript yep. and all that sort of stuff. So there's a lot to do. So my guess is, is it's going to be about three quarters, two thirds, you know, defeating the Borg and a third to a quarter of the of the postscript. But it'll be interesting yep. to see how that how that comes about. Um, so Picard's old fire about the Borg comes out in that discussion in in jack's mm -hmm. quarters that they have i really like seeing that in picard again yep um i wonder if if jack is going to be this locutus 2.0 the better locutus in the sense like the the queen has said in several times i think it was in first contact and it was it first contact yeah first contact yep. and in um other places 
how she was looking for Locutus to be a counterpart to her, right. not just another drone, but another co- a counterpart. Um, and maybe Jack is, is supposed to be that counterpart. Uh, yeah. That, that- yeah. Well, I see, I, I think it, it, he's a different position because you notice she doesn't talk about him as the speaker. She talks about him right. as the voice box, right? The locutus, which is supposed to be the speaker. Yeah. And so he's supposed to, basically the way I took it is he's supposed to be a signal booster, an organic signal booster for the board collective signal. Right. So it's not about, for locutus, it was about what he knew about yeah. Starfleet. Uh, whereas for Jack, it's just who he is. Exactly. He's just a convenient tool. He's a transmitter. He's a transmitter. Yeah. And of course, and that's part of what the Borg ended up implanting in him through Locutus. And they say that, you know, this came from Locutus. Long, it's a long game, and it assumes that Picard's going to have a child, doesn't it? It does. And, yeah. I know, mean, there's the and potential it, flaw in their plan. <laughs> true. True. But of course, you know, that the, the Borg aren't always known for planning the best, even for being a you know, uh, collective species yeah. or they throw a lot of things out there and see which stick, you know, that's, there's it, always that too. <laughs> yeah. It could have been, that could be it too, but you know, but, but it is a, it is a, uh, species that can afford to play the long game. Right. Right. Exactly. Yep. You know, because they, they just, just keep adding people to it. So it doesn't matter if a drone dies or a thousand or a hundred thousand drone dies. They just add them. Add them it, right. And then they, and it doesn't matter if a, if a if a thousand plans fail if one succeeds. Yeah, exactly. So Picard tells Jack that Starfleet protocols dictate that we act in the interests of everyone else, which is another variation on the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Mm-hmm. The one, um, but Jack responds, "What about the protocols of a father?" And this is another time where Jack kind of throws out at him. And remember that that flashback to the scene in the bar where Picard's. Loyalty to Starfleet as his family versus his actual family obligations and this tension within Picard between these two poles in his life yeah. uh, come out again, which is, uh, I think, a nice, a, n- a nice draw because there are a lot of people who feel these tensions between duty, a higher, you know, a duty to a larger institution, whether mm-hmm. it's duty to their country or duty to whatever, or to, to God and duty to their family or their loved ones. Oh, yeah. And that's, that's a balance. I mean, you would know far better than I would, you know, that every father has to deal with, you know, you've yeah. got your job and you've got your family and you've got your responsibilities to the to the government or to the, the, the country and all these things. And how do you balance that? And Picard has not until recently had to deal with that. Because right. He didn't know he was a father until recently. I do like how between Riker and Picard and Beverly, frankly, we mm-hmm. we're really pulling out all of these strings about uh, and Jordy. Uh, don't yeah. forget Jordy um, oh, about family and uh, you know the obligations of parents and their children and these bonds that are important. I really think some of the best stories out there are stories that kind of tease out these bonds of love, of familial love. Star Wars has done it from the beginning. This has always been about fathers and sons and daughters and mothers yep. and, and all that. And I think Star Trek, some of the best Star Trek has done it too with these bonds that we see. Well, it, it's interesting in TNG, the, the focus was on Worf for that. Yes. He had Alexander. And I mean, that was yes. a, a little bit later that they brought him in, but that was still an aspect that Worf had to deal with. And now, Worf, they, surprisingly, they haven't even mentioned him yet. Kind of Alexander or yeah, Alexander. Yeah. I think Alexander's is gone. I think, I mean, they wrote him he off. was, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, I think they retconned Alexander out of existence, frankly. I mean, but, he was like I mean, a Klingon still, warrior for a bit, but that's it. Yeah. But they, it's still, it's just, that was something in TNG that brought yeah. this up in the first place. And Picard kind of had to deal with that a little bit. Cause is the captain of this, this, this flagship with all these children. He's kind of a father figure. It's almost like a priest, like we call as we priests are called father. Yeah. Captain Picard kind of played that role a little bit too. Maybe not a spiritual father, but still a father figure within the ship. Yeah, metaphorical father in, in that case. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, so when Jack takes control of the security officers to escort him off the ship to, you know, to go to the shuttle, uh, you know, Picard's like, what is this? And he says, futility. I love that because, you know, because resistance is futile, you know? So it's got, it's that, that's a weighted phrase there. I like that. Mm-hmm. Um, turns out the voice in Jack's head was never Beverly after all, even though we, you know, we'd heard uh, yep. Gates McFadden's voice, but it turns yep. out it was the Borg Queen's voice. Well, if um, you notice it, too, it changed after he said that. Yeah. It just subtle, but it changed from Gates McFadden to Alice Krieg, who is voicing the Queen. Yes. Alice Krieg has returned uh, to to that original role. We don't see her face at all, which is interesting. Nope. It, Which is, I don't know. I mean, we do we, is it because they're, it's suspense, a dr- dramatic. We, we're not, we're not going to see her until later. Or is it because Alice Krieg is now 20 something years older and doesn't look like the Borg queen who shouldn't age at all. Um, I mean, we got, um, we got a, a retcon on why Brent Spiner looks older. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, in, in, in the, the, the person who plays the queen is not her. It's someone else. There is a, a body double. Oh, uh, okay. That is I see. in the credits. It's a body double. And of course, you know, they could CGI her in. I mean, it would not be that hard just to CGI in her face. Right. Not, in, you're not with modern, you know, again, modern technology with the de-aging and stuff like that. It's not it that, hard. that yeah. hard anymore. So and it's, I mean, last, and it's possible yeah. that's why they didn't show it is because it's not hard, but that doesn't mean it's cheap either. I mean, last season they solved this by having Andy Wershing just recast mm-hmm. as it. But uh, unfortunately, and sadly, Andy Wershing died between Shortly seasons. After, yeah. Yeah. But, um, and, and there's also shocking, the aspect but, yeah. of the, the queen being the voice in the darkness. It is suitably creepy. That. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, there is a poignant scene where Beverly and Jack, uh, Beverly and, and John Luke are in the uh, conference room off the bridge. And Beverly kind of talks about how she's now lost two sons. Mm-hmm. And it is poignant. That is, wow. That is. That would be tough. That would be. That's hard. Gut-wrenching. I mean, Wesley's not dead, and neither is Jack, for that matter, but they've both been taken away from her, where she mm-hmm. doesn't have in touch with them. Uh, that That is... I am glad we don't, like, paper over Beverly's loss in order to emphasize Picard's loss, because his loss is... While it's still tragic, it's not nearly the, the loss of a mother losing two sons. Yeah, especially, so. again, since he only recently found out he was a father. There is a line later where it where it talks about there, she said, you know, it says it says so much about you that it took this long for the Borg to come out in Jack paraphrasing, but you know, it took, they yeah. held out this long. Right. Right. And I'm still wondering whether Wesley is going to be part of the solution at all, you know, to save his brother. I don't know. No, I don't know. Cause there were, there were rumors that we were going to see evil Wesley that he was <sighs> okay, turned against, but, I don't think so. I don't, I don't think so. I, it feels well, yeah, weird be, that you would I don't, finish the, the TNG return, which we get without one of the characters. We even saw Tasha in a hologram, yeah. you know, but we don't, but we, the, the idea that we wouldn't see Wesley at all. It's kind of weird to me. I just, well, but again, we're coming down to the last minutes of this season, the yeah. last minutes of a nine hour plus movie. And they haven't even introduced him except mentioning him by name in the ninth episode, ninth part. It could be a day six Mac and it was a solution to oh, the, yeah. because we, the, it seems like there's how are this, like they've gotten themselves so deep in the hole. How could they possibly fix this? I wonder if even just Wesley showing up in Jack's vision to strengthen him against the Borg infiltration in his mind or something along those lines. I mean, that, that I could see that. Yeah, it, it's. I mean, obviously, he had the cameo at the end of season two. Yes, but that was it. You know, and yeah, I just what 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 sits uncomfortable for me with this is just this idea of all of a sudden we are going to do a Deus Ex Machina. This season has been so well written by and large, it really yeah. has. And then all of a sudden you throw in the oh, by the way, Wesley comes in and saves the day. Yeah, or I mean, I don't want him to day. come in and 
and wave his hand, but I would I wouldn't mind having him be a part of it somehow. Even okay, maybe even just after the denouement, after the the they defeat the Borg, he shows up on the bridge of the D and says, "Hey, everybody!" And we end with a shot of the whole crew there. Yeah. I'd be okay with that. It yeah, it would I be mean, fan that, fan service, but I'd be okay with it. I, as as I put on Discord, I'm here for the fan service. Yes, that's right. <laughs> I'm still here for the fan service. <laughs> All right. Speaking of fan service, uh, especially for us ship geeks, we get to see the Enterprise F. Nice, very nice. With Admiral with Elizabeth Shelby. Yes. In command. We get to see her, you know, fulfill her prediction. By the way, yes, from all, from all the way back to best of both worlds. Yeah, well, she's fleet admiral, so she's the top admiral, and she's in it, charge of the Enterprise F. Is she in charge? Like, she's not the CNC. They keep changing the name of the the person in yeah. charge of the whole fleet. Is she the CNC? No, no, uh, fleet admiral is is a kind of like like I said, the top admiral. The top like admiral of this particular yeah. fleet. Yeah. Kind of like a chief okay. chief of staff or something like that type of position. Right. Kind of um, a step below like whatever whoever's in charge, yeah. like if Janeway was in charge. So of like she she would be the one who would in theory coordinate all the fleet, where the fleet is gonna go. That's why she's involved in this whole idea of the fleet control and all right. that. Right, but right. It, like the chief but it of is, operations. It is funny though, yeah. you know, in best best of both worlds, she was so upset with Riker that he was standing in her way. Well, she just went right around him to the top, so <laughs> that right. didn't stop Ed, her. Ed got the center seat of the Enterprise, not the D, yep. not the E, but the F, which yeah. is good. Yep. Um, I kind of like the F. It kind of a kind of a fat little ship, I guess. Well, it's got it's bulky. I'll put it yeah. that way. It's, it's got, not as it's sleek as the E. Of the uh, got a little bit of the uh, sovereign class and the or the uh, saucer section. Yeah, it does. Cells. I, I got to say, I'm kind of sad that the Sovereign class is gone, that the Enterprise E has never really got much time on screen. Uh, oh. I kind of like that ship. Yeah, I did. Oh, I did, too. I, I actually yeah. I, I hate to say it, and I'm probably going to cause controversy, but I like the E better than the D. <laughs> I know. I'm with you on that. I like the E better but, uh, than the D. I love, yeah, I we love know, that as. Yeah. Go ahead. I love that <laughs> when they're in the shuttle going to get the D. By the way, spoiler, yeah. we've already referenced it, but at the end, we get to see the D. They take yeah. off in the D. but um. They're going to get it, and well, we can't use the E. And everybody looks at Worf. It wasn't my fault. <laughs> it's not my fault. We don't know what he did, but something <laughs> went wrong with the with the E. I don't know if he was captain at the time or what, but yeah, somehow now, he's is, technically responsible. I mean, there is an idea that because we saw the E in Prodigy in that big battle where all the Starfleet vessels are turned against each other, yeah, that that was the event that destroyed the it destroyed or at least. Damage the E beyond repair. Right, right. Yes, we talked about that before. That we'd seen that. The that some people had seen that. So it is. Uh, it is interesting. So, um, so with the F is here. Uh, those fireworks for Frontier Day, by the way, make an awful lot of noise for being in space. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> I mean, no. I usually get yeah. I kind of give them like extend a little bit of uh, suspension of disbelief for a lot of the space noise, because otherwise these, it would be very strange to to, was, to watch these space shows. It was transmitted over subspace, you know, so that people could hear them, quote unquote. Yes, we, <laughs> we, we created artificial fireworks noise for you. Uh, so yeah, that's fine. Uh, and so they're going to demonstrate the very Borg like fleet synchronization. I think someone on somewhere in discord or somewhere, uh, mentioned there should be a big button set that says turn off fleet synchronization that the captain can push if something yeah. goes wrong like this sort of thing have we never not learned anything from way well, in, back with the m5 computer well and that's that's actually that gets uh, admiral shelby gets called on it and realizes her mistake about one minute too late or you know yeah but um yeah it was well and that and of course what happened is you know like they get all locked in and they're under control of Admiral Shelby in theory. And the Titan comes in and the Titan immediately gets grabbed as well as yeah. part of this. So every fleet, yep. every ship in the fleet that is in that sector, in theory sector or that area is lined up in this synchronization. Yeah. Which in theory is a good idea, but that's always been a, a, a struggle in Star Trek is how much automation can you do? Like you said, the M5 from TOS, we've seen, mm -hmm. um, time and time again in other other things other um other shows where even like talking about the the android revolt 
on Mars, right? stuff like that. Yes. It's, it's at the core of Star Trek. The, the Star Trek philosophy has always been that no matter what progress we make, what no matter what technology we create, humanity, and well, you know, we'll include all the aliens in it too, but humanity is at the core and should never be removed. It's vital. Our humanity is vital to everything we do, whether it's exploration or, you know, in defense or anything like that. But the human, the human person, the human nature yep. is vital and should never be removed in place of purely technological solutions or purely logical solutions right. for, for that matter. Well, um, and, and this and is another example. That, Ginta had that a couple yeah. of times in this this season where he's, you know we're going to maximum work. Shouldn't you let engineering know? Oh, that's all automated now. Yeah, you know, and of course, yes, I mean, they did like something that can be controlled by the computer, not by humans. Same thing with uh, the the link between the ships. You know, of course, we saw that as oh, this is this is disturbing because then they can find the Titan. But right, we don't realize it's even more disturbing than we thought. Yes, that's true. That's true. Um, also, the also true is the. Our just our our concern at transporters, the problem of oh, transporters. Yes. Uh, we have we, Dr. McCoy was right for, from the very beginning that transporters are a bad thing. Well, um, and it's, they made them even more disturbing in this. I mean, how yeah. they work? Right. They, they don't. They basically you'll get. They basically have base code for each species. So they say every human has this code. Every Vulcan <laughs> has this code. Every you know, and that's yeah. That's supposed to, you know, cut down on the data stream, but that's kind of creepy if you think about it, where every person who's gone through that transporter, yeah, it probably hasn't rewritten anything, but still the fact is it, it took part of them and said, we're going to leave this on the cutting room floor, beam you over, and then just reinsert it and hope we didn't make yeah. a mistake in coding that. <laughs> I mean, it kind of goes to the point where for 99% per more than 99% of the DNA of every human being is the same from one person to the next. And there's that 1% that differentiates us from each other. Exactly. Um, and so that's ca kind of what they're going at there. And so that the, the Borg figured out how to m insert their special Borg organic implants yep. into that 99%. They, um, they basically yeah. write DNA assembly into the trans through the changelings into the transporter systems. So every person who be, went through the transporters, which is, by the way, why Ro Lauren did not want to go through it. Right. Um, but every person who went through the transporter, um, they got this extra code written in, this extra assembly written into their DNA. And right. that ended up them becoming trans uh, receivers. Now, I, in, and they also get around the problem, the, the, the logic problem, the story problem of, well, if everybody's got this in their DNA, then everybody is, can be assimilated by the Borg and therefore ends the story. But Beverly points out that only people under the age of 25, their frontal lobes are still under, or prefrontal cortex is still under development, and that's why they can be assimilated, and anyone over the age of 25 can't. But, of course, there's a hole in that. Well, no, there isn't. There isn't, because it's not everyone under the age of 25. It's Everybody whose prefrontal cortex has not been finished. okay, it's still in development. And then they say, such as before the age of 25 for humans. Okay. And other species, it presumably a different period. Different age. So Vulcans could be 100 years or something like that, you know. Right. And other species that don't have prefrontal cortexes would not be assimilated, but would presumably be treated like the rest of the unassimilated crew. Correct. Okay. Correct. All right. Was, I'll buy that. <laughs> there, yeah, it, it, no, it, it made sense. It made sense that yeah. it would be whatever, you know, for this prefrontal cortex, whatever point that it fully matures, it no longer works. Um, I did like the, the, the take again I saw online. I can't remember. Sorry if it was somebody on Discord. Yeah. This is almost like Terry Metalla saying, okay, this is the old Star Trek fans taking back Star Trek from the young <laughs> Star Trek fans that, are, that have ruined it through Discovery. I suppose that's one way to look at it. I kind of, I mean, the other thing, the other way to look at it, I mean, and I, I, and I appreciate that actually. That's kind of funny. Um, the other way is it's symbolic of the idea of we have to save Star Trek, to save, to save the Federation. Mm -hmm. It will take our older crew. Like they, the yep. old people are not disposable. <laughs> Exactly. You know, we're still important. The young, you know, the young people are vital and, and all that, but, um, but it's the, it's age and maturity that saves the day exactly. here. So, 
I'm, I'm, I'm all of that. <laughs> I, I, it works for me too. <laughs> um, so they, uh, yeah, it, uh, that's my, my note here is of course, being old is what saves them. It's poetic is my note. Yep. Uh, so the Jack ends up on, we mentioned how Jack ends up on board the Borg vessel and goes into the, the queen's chamber and she's talking to him and she calls him, Regenerati and yep. Puer Dei, and he does make this like you have this fondness for Latin <laughs> for some yeah. reason, <laughs> which, I, which I think is great because because uh, you know, uh, Picard was Lucutus. Um, no one really explains why the Borg Queen likes Latin, um, but I think I thought it was very interesting that she calls him Puer Dei, which is a a term. It means child of God, and of yeah. course, is a term we usually in in Christian Christianity in the, in the Catholic Church we reserve to God, to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is pure date. Well, and, and we are children of God as well. I mean, we are children of, of right. as through baptism, through, you know, we have been uh, um, adopted as children of God. Sure. But yeah. Yep. He is the child. He is the son of God. Yeah. So, which is very different. Yeah. And I, I like that where he goes, I'm neither the regeneration nor a child of God. Right. I mean, in a sense, he's functioning in the story as sort of an, antichrist figure where he's where he's being seen as being used by the borg queen as a anti-savior in in the sense of he cause to cause the downfall of many as opposed to the salvation of many well, and and it kind of depends although, on the perspective though from the borg's perspective he is seen as a savior and that's why she calls right. him that right 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 no i agree with that um but it's it's, it's an interesting uh metaphorical role that jack is playing in this story as the the, the son um you know the queen would be the in the, the role of satan he is the the son and she's corrupted him it could be also that he plays a christ-like role where he gives you know the son sacrifices himself to save yeah. the many like jesus and, did at easter which is appropriate for when we're watching this yeah exactly and i i, I think that's the more likely conclusion and whether or not he survives, we'll see. I, you know, yeah. it would be interesting if he, it does end up being a sacrificial death. Or resurrection. Or resurrection. <laughs> yeah. 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 There's that. Uh, so that would be, that would be interesting to see. But, I, and, and I just, you know, as a Catholic watching this, I just heard Puer Dei and I'm like, what? <laughs> That's yeah, just exactly. Kind of, it just set me back for a second. Um, so um, the, the art, TNG crew gets to the Titans maintenance deck. They're trying to get on board a maintenance shuttle to get off the ship. Um, Shaw and seven and Rafi are all there as well, but the Borgified crew have found them. Uh, and the, um, and so Shaw and Rafi and seven stay behind to cover their escape because our TNG crew has to make it to oh, the yes. D alone without anyone else. I, you know, of course I, I do. I do love, uh, Troy, as they come out, oh, the turbo lift open. I've never been so happy to see so many wrinkles. <laughs> that was good. That was good. <laughs> that was that was a great line. Um, but by the way, did we close the loop on Shelby? She was killed. She died. Um, yeah, sort of. A, so she sort of a retributive as, death. Yeah. So as we haven't quite mentioned this point yet, but when Jack jacks in, yep. or is jacked in, you know, he has the the snake uh, cables <laughs> jammed into his back. It sends out a Borg signal and all the young crew, and we see the two LaForge daughters, we see uh, some of the other bridge crew uh, get taken yep. over. Um, and then we see Shelby, it's like, what's going on? We hear her, she's talking, she's trying to figure it out. Cause, cause Picard sends out a message to say, you know, Admiral Shelby, there's, you know, the, we've got a problem here, you know? And about that time, then the signal's cut off and we see her, uh, standing there trying they're, they're taking over the bridge they're taking over the bridge and two of them literally assassinate her i mean it's like blank right phaser shots right that's right there by the way we see a lot of ships interesting ship names oh, in there yes. there's there's uh, an excelsior 2 there's um uh what was some of the other ones there was okay, a reliant so a, bunch, a. Bunch of, uh, yeah so i've got a bunch of them um, okay so we've got the uss ross and that's, I'm guessing that's Admiral Ross from DS9. Yep. Um, the USS Akuda, as in Denise and Mike Akuda, who, were, who have been long time oh, yeah. scientific. TNG advisors, special effects. Uh, yes, and special effects. Yep. And special effects as well. The USS yep. Gagarin, as in Yuri Gagarin. 
Yeah. Uh, the USS Harlan, as in Harlan Ellison. Uh, right. The USS Hikaru Sulu. No, no need Very nice. explanation there. USS yeah. Cochrane, again, no need there. Uh, and then the USS Drexler, who he was actually a member of the art department for generations in DS9 and then was, was now a concept designer for Picard. And so there's oh. a, and the only reason I know this is there's a, a, a tweet from uh, Terry Metalis where it's the Akudas and this Drexler. Sorry, I forgot to write down his first name. I, th- I think it starts with a D, but I can't remember. But th- yeah. they were there at Metallus' house, I'm assuming, watching Picard. Oh, cool. So. There was also a Pulaski, which could be Catherine Pulaski, oh. but it could also be Casimir Pulaski, a famous Polish hero. Yep. Um, uh, I there's a assume f- it's Dr. Pulaski. Let's do that. Uh, there's the USS Forrest, which could be Admiral Forrest from Enterprise. Mm. But that was, right. I was thinking, could be him. About him. Um, yeah, and then there was a couple other interesting ones as well. But I, now, I, there was, I, yeah, there was a Reliant A. Yep, it wasn't that's right. A Defiant A. It was a Reliant A. Yeah, there was a Defiant class or something in, involved. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was just a lot of fun. There was looking looking at all so the ship little, names and stuff. Little names that they threw in, and of course we had the yeah. NX one F. Yes. Well, one, th- one thing we should, should mention is we were questioning what was this Frontier Day, and we weren't quite <sighs> sure about it, but yes. Admiral Shelby explains it. It's 250 years since the NX-01 Enterprise left space. Launched. Time. Yeah. Yep. That's right. So we finally have that. They went the, When they first went out to the final frontier, you yep. know, when humanity in the, although it was, it's. Essentially, uh, I think the way they put it is because I mean, humans had been out there already, but yeah. with the launch of the first warp five capable uh, exactly. starship, it's essentially the, the beginning of Starfleet. Yeah. Which, you know, we kind of we talk about the, the U.S. Navy's birthday um, mm-hmm. and there are several different dates that are sometimes thrown out. But and there's one that's on the calendar, but it, one is the launch of the uh, U.S.'s Constitution is sometimes uh, seen as the, you know, potentially the you know old iron sides the uh beginning of well, the u.s there, navy that sort of thing one that kind of predate that predates the revolutionary war that they use yes there was the one for the continental navy where the the uh the U, the continental congress uh passed an, a, an act a law to fund and found a continental navy and some people you know there's some dispute and i think right. that's the date that is on the calendar uh for that's, the u.s navy's the birthday we celebrate yeah yeah. Um, so there's a couple different ones um, that you could, you could uh, look at there. Um, but in any case, so that, yes, that is what Frontier Day is. Uh, there's a moment once they get on board the shuttle where, you know, Data and, uh, and Jordy are getting the shuttle ready. And Data's like, there's just no way we can survive this. And he says, Data, could you be a little more positive? And Data turns to him and, and a very positive voice says, I hope we die quickly. Yeah. <laughs> I had to pause and laugh at that one because that was hysterical. Yes. And then that look on his face like. <laughs> <laughs> Could you be a little more positive? <laughs> well, there was another, that... another great line regarding data. I, I, well, I think it was seven that said it where, or yeah. And she goes, the robot's right. And he gives her just a dirty look. Yeah, the robot's right. It's like, hey, that's an insult. <laughs> yeah. So we mentioned that uh, this is where Shaw gets shot and dies, and Seven and Rafi stay behind. I, I, I'm pleased that Rafi says, "I'm not leaving you." You know, and they leave it at that. They don't have to expand on it. They just like that. They, they are they're close and connected, and we don't have to go any further than and that. The last line: "The con is yours, Seven of Nine. Yes, very nice, very nicely done. Um, yeah, I, I, again, I, I will salute Captain Shaw. <laughs> yep. Your memory will live on. So, uh, Jordy comes up with the plan. He's been, he's got been restoring a hot rod in the, uh, garage out back behind the shade tree. Yes. <laughs> yes. That, that, that's very much, uh, you know, like if, if your dad's hot rod got wrecked years ago and you were able to find it in the junkyard <laughs> and restore it, that's what yeah. he did with the enterprise. I mean, D. it, this stretches the bounds of credibility. To a, a bit. I mean, you have this <laughs> massive warship. Yeah, it's like I had the USS uh, New Jersey battleship BB sixty two that I've been restoring. You know, in, a, in my spare time. Now he uh, was in charge of the fleet museum, and so that is yeah. part of the idea 
So you could, you could yeah. see it. And, it, and it, they did say that it was, you know, the, the USS Syracuse, which is, I think, a, a Galaxy class ship we never saw. Yeah. Um, yeah. But that's what provided it's got her the nacelles and engines. Yeah, yeah the that's true. Um, and this so all you had to do was restore the saucer section, which we know was recovered from Viridian 3, where it crashed. Right. Right, right. He did say that. Okay, all right. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, so it meant that he spent yeah. twenty years redoing the saucer section, and he's been. Uh, and apparently, the ship can be run with only the bridge crew because they've automated enough of it, which is a bit ironic, uh, considering well, this, is, he, this is very much search for Spock. Yeah, he stole the original Enterprise when it was all that's bad right. and bruised, and Scotty automated that's true. a bunch of it. Yeah, and. Um, he Jody does say something like, "Well, the reason we have to take this old ship is because it's analog, and it's like, oh, it's not no, it's analog. Not. It's just not ne- doesn't have the new like fleet synchronization equipment installed. Just say that. Don't call it analog." Well, and it, of course, we we got it. We got to answer one another controversy here. The Defiant A is sitting there. It's a literal warship, but designed to fight the Borg. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, they, you can't have the the Enterprise crew taking, you know, a, 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 a DS9 ship. The, the yeah, defiant. <laughs> but from a poetic standpoint, yeah, the, know, it's got to be the. I know, I'm, I'm being, yeah, I'm being silly. It, <laughs> yeah, you. And this is this. I said there are two things that disappointed me a little bit about this episode. The first was that the, well, the Borg was the big bad guys. Yeah, and the fact that yes, it's the D they're going to be flying into combat with you know, or flying <laughs> right. at you to sol- save the day but again, right. it was small because squee the enterprise d you know <laughs> <laughs> the, i gotta say the reconstruction of the old sets they look perfect it looked so yes. good um the uh i do like how wharf is like well uh the, the weapons isn't aren't, aren't up to snuff and they're like wharf <laughs> nostalgia <laughs> yeah it's perfect uh and Picard says, uh, it, it's just, I forget exactly how he proceeds the, the line, but he's uh, basically, he missed the carpets. Like, the one yeah. thing I missed well, as was the carpets. we're all here together and we're remembering, and I missed the carpeting. <laughs> yeah. and, I do like that, that. It's a brightly lit bridge, finally. Yes. <laughs> we can and see everybody's like, faces. Hello, chair. He's, like, grabbing his chair <laughs> he sits at. Um, they did have the, that uh, was awesome. the, the commemoration plaque, or the... the uh, the plaque on the bridge there and had all the names. Yep. You can see Roddenberry's names and Michael yep. Piller and all them that were involved in the original. So yeah, a little fourth wall break there, but very, very well, but that's, that was there originally. That was there originally. Right. Well, you just never because could see Admiral. It. Well, you did. Yeah. I think you did kind of see really? it actually in generations. I think you saw it. Oh, okay. But in the original was, SD. Yeah. On TV, you could no, yeah. you can see it on the, the old CRT. Yeah. But, but if you watch the, the the remastered TNG, I think you can actually read it. Yeah, because it, they just never intended. The yeah, black was there, and it had oh, yeah. like you know Admiral Gene Roddenberry and Admiral Michael Piller and all them. You know, yeah, that is good. I'm glad they did that. Um, and uh, Major Barrett's voice for the computer yes. as well, which yes. I, I presumably deep faked it. I'm not sure. I think, the reconstruction no, I think actually. I I saw something online. I thought where it actually was a line from. Um, an episode wasn't because there were a couple episodes where they had to completely shut down the enterprise. And I think it was taken from that. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. It's what they also did from, um, in prodigy where they used her voice the same way. It was an archive. Okay. Hers and Spock's and Odo's and a couple others. Yeah. yeah, It was, um, no, I think that was actual lines from the series itself (laughs) did a little better job cleaning it up than they did in prodigy. I have to admit. Yeah. I, it was nice to hear her voice, though. I got to yes, say, it was. it was nice. All right, so that's and that's where we end the cliffhanger till the resolution next time. Any last notes, Father Corey? Boy, I'm going through all my notes and trying to think what. <laughs> <laughs> We've talked about a lot. We talked. Oh, we we do see yeah. a transwarp conduit that Jack. I, now I, I wasn't sure if Jack went through the transwarp conduit or the board, or if the board did. Through it. Yeah, you know, but tr- either way, we hear true. about a transwarp conduit, and then there's like green flashing light on his face. So I, I'm presuming he actually went through the conduit and maybe that'll get uh, mentioned next time. Okay. Yeah. Um, Interesting. But yeah, that that's, Oh, and he, he calls uh Picard calls Riker number one. Yes. Yes. We get that. And we get engage, engage. make it so engage. Yep. Yeah. We get that too. So, yep. and it ends with it warping off. 
<laughs> very nice very nice i mean it, in the music and everything it was like a huge nostalgia moment it was wonderful to see i loved it yeah it was fantastic All right. so before we get to our great feedback i have to break yes and this is this <laughs> you, is not even a humble so. break this is not even no, a humble no. break uh, those who have <laughs> been on our discord um you probably saw me talk about i'm going to be going to the the, the the final episode Picard IMAX experience in Seattle. Nice. So they are doing for on Wednesday. So six hours before the episode release on Paramount Plus. No spoilers. Are, oh no. Yeah. I'll probably post the you know they've all died. You know yeah. the, the old joke is spoiler they all died. No. Yeah. Um. They are doing in ten cities. Seattle being one of them. At one theater, one IMAX theater. They are doing this experience where it's going to be the, this episode Vox and the final episode as a movie on IMAX screen and free. Wow. And I was able to get one of the passes. It was free? It was free. Wow. Wow. Yeah, but the site crashed. So it was supposed to go live at 11 o'clock my time last Wednesday. And it crashed like at 10.58. And, and come back oh, up man. for about a half an hour or so. And I was able wow. to get in and quickly grab one. Now they're, they're, they're purposely overbooking it because they want the theater full. They don't want any yeah. seats anywhere in the theater, which you can understand. And it probably won't be a problem. It doesn't mean I'll have to be there probably an hour early or whatever, but that's all right. But it's going to be so cool. They're, you know, the free concessions, they're giving away posters. I don't know if that means everybody who goes is going to get a poster or if it's, gonna, wow. you know, you know random draw or something like that. Um, yeah. There's going to be a, like a live Q and a, obviously it's going to be all, you know, it's not like we can submit questions, but it's, you know, wherever the, it'd be live crew, broadcaster from LA or whatever, right. from QA from wherever it's going to be. Um, yeah. And it's going to be a lot of fun. Cause you know, people are going to, sh- they're recommending people. They want people to show up in costume Co- and the yeah. whole works. I probably will wear my secrets of star Trek shirt because of course. Nice. Please do. Promote, Please do. Got to promote. <laughs> um, so it actually, it's dumb luck that it just worked out because yeah. I'm not making a special trip to Seattle for this. I actually, yeah. my plan was to go to Seattle this coming week. Like when you hear this episode, I will be either on the way or are actually already in the, the central Washington area where my dad lives. Yeah. Um, so I was planning on being in the, in Washington and it's only two hours from my dad's house across Snoqualmie pass to where this, uh, where this is at. So, uh, I, I just like, I had to jump at it. I had to go for it and I got the pass. And so it's just nice. dumb luck. It worked out and I'm looking forward to it and it's going to be a lot of fun. And I'm going to try to take as many pictures as I can, obviously not during the filming, the showing itself, but the line and yep. the theater and everything with everybody in, you know, in, in their costumes and everything. And I think it's going to be a blast. I am really looking forward to it. I'm kind of excited because this is the first of these kind of events I've ever been able to go to. I've never been able to go to a con. I've never been yeah. able to go to something like a special screening like this. So, uh, nice. it's going to be a lot of fun and I can't wait. I really can't. Well, w- we're going to want to hear all about it when you come back and we want to see your pictures. So we'll yes, definitely, I will definitely talk about that. Definitely be posting pictures to the discord. I will absolutely be posting pictures to the discord. Like I said, no spoilers. Um, yeah. I don't want to spoil it for anyone. Um, I might, I but, might, I'm going to, you know what? I'm going to put one spoiler. I don't know what's going to be yet. I'm going to put one spoiler <laughs> in Star okay. Trek spoilers on Wednesday night. So this is a warning to those of you on discord. And if you're not on discord, join us at sqpn.com slash discord. <laughs> That's I'm right. Put one spoiler. And I'll have to figure out what it's going to be. Cause I have right. to. <laughs> there is a, there is a feature of discord where you can black bar. You can put a black bar yeah. over things so that it, you have to click on it explicitly to it will see the, what's it will, under it. Yes. It will be in the star Trek, just uh, star Trek spoilers channel. And it will be black. I'm, I don't want yeah. to ruin it for anyone, but I will put it right, right, right. there for those, for those who like that sort of thing. So good, good, good. Um, awesome. I can't wait to hear all about it. I'm it's very so jealous. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So let's get to that feedback that we talked about. Um, first, a little bit of feedback on our last episode, Surrender. Uh, Dennis on YouTube wrote, in today's highly politicized world, I found it interesting that Lore's color in the brain scan was red and Data's was blue. Ultimately, pure, untainted blues defeated the evil, twisted reds. Hollywood and 
I mean, I'm not going to say that you're wrong. I, I just I will point out that red as a danger color, it, you know, has has been yeah. part of the our. Well, I was going to say lore, but part of our culture <laughs> for a long time. Uh, well, so you know, red, red, red is, is danger. Red, red is kind of in our DNA, if you well, will. To really, I mean, yeah. it's part of our human experience that red is because it's a color that stands out, and of course, fire right. is red. So and blood, yeah, yeah, and blood. You know, and and so and. Yeah, I, that's kind of an American thing, though, because you look at other countries, their red means something else for whatever yeah. party. You know, I think I think up in Canada, it's usually the Liberal Party is actually red usually, but I, I, I can't remember right. for sure. So, yeah, don't I, I I I get where you're coming from and I understand it. <laughs> I don't play that much into it. Red has always meant evil. I mean, yeah, look at Star Wars. What color red is lightsabers. that guy's lightsabers? <laughs> yeah. yeah, red. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> so, right. I mean. I get it, but let's not think too much into that. Let's just enjoy that. This yeah. has been a really good season. Yes. Oh, I, I forgot to mention, I was going to say like, because we, you know, the Star Trek fans all swiftied the, the ticket system for the final episode in, in IMAX. That's a really good sign. That says yeah. something to, to the powers that be well, about we, what we, we feel about this ep- that's season. A good point. And we talked about that last week where um, hopefully Paramount is watching and they probably are. I mean, just, oh, yeah. just the fact that, you know, we got Strange New Worlds because the fans said, we want this, we want this. And they yes. got it, and we watched it, and we liked it, and now we got this, and we watched it, and we liked it. And, you know, I know there's going to be someone, probably not directly hired by Paramount, but someone who's, whose job it is is to kind of watch the crowd. You know, oh, somebody yeah. contract or whatever, and report back yeah. to Paramount uppers. You know, it's like, oh, yeah, the Seattle experience is what we saw, the LA experience is what we saw, and they they're watching. They want to see. Yep. Yeah. They yeah. Uh our next feedback, all of this uh, our the remaining feedback comes from people who were watching the uh, uh talking about the Vox this current episode and uh, I didn't I don't have all the feedback because some of it was basically what about the Gerardi Borg? <laughs> so yeah. that's you're all included. I'm not personally uh, <laughs> leaving you out, but uh, these are these are representative. Uh so the first one comes from Ryan via email. Uh, I'm sure I'm ec- just echoing what you guys and others are saying. This is some of the greatest Star Trek ever produced and I've watched this episode over and over multiple times. But, Ryan sent this on Thursday. <laughs> like mm-hmm. he means one day, the, that first day. Not well, only had, is it, in a, go ahead. Sorry, I was gonna say we had feedback. Some of the feedback that Dom's reading, we got like by you know nine o'clock, ten o'clock Mountain Time. <laughs> yeah. It was pretty. You guys got up early <laughs> before work to watch this. Not only is it nostalgic, but they actually took time to write a plausible story instead of phoning it in and giving each other a hug. With that mm-hmm. said, I have to put on my Jimmy Aiken hat and ask one question. Where's Dr. Girardi's friendly neighborhood Borg? We're with you on that, Ryan. We got it. Shout out, shout out to Alice Creek for showing up and Majel Barrett's cameo. Terry Metalis will always have my vote each and every time. Yeah. Ter- Terry Metalis has earned a lot of credit among Star Trek fans. Terry Metalis for showrunner. I'm already doing the campaign. <laughs> Uh, Aaron Minix via email writes, it was an exciting and action packed episode, but I'm unclear as to why Jack is needed by the Borg. It seems that the Borg could took control of the fleet without needing his help at all. The transporter DNA implanting scheme was really all they needed. Couple that with changelings infiltrating Starfleet to get the whole fleet linked together and in one place at a time in the capital of the Federation looks to be toast. So while this time and energy going after Jack. Is it to assimilate everyone older? But it didn't seem that the Borg cared about that since they wanted to eliminate not assimilate everyone else. Although also, uh, well, let's talk about that first. I will get to the re- yep. the second part. They needed Jack because he is the transmitter. They, they yes. couldn't take control of everyone without him being the, some sort of important organic link. Right. There's you, something unique to Jack that lets them make that connection. Yeah. That, that's, that's where I, I said that he's the signal booster. You know, every, you know, every, right. every transmitter has a signal booster. It has something that, you know, a, a device that ramps up the power so that it can be transmitted. That's what it is. Yeah, exactly. In a way. So, you know, how, however, the, 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 the specifics are, that's basically is Jack was the linchpin. He was the, the keys, the MacGuffin to them being able to have, he is the signal in that sense. Yeah. He's the signal that the Borg are using to cause the assimilation to activate. So yeah, that's can't, that's can't why he signal. was necessary. Oh wait, different series. <laughs> different series. Uh also um 
Aaron continues, the subtext is screaming at the audience. Younger, newer Trek, symbolized by the young officers, is taking over and losing its identity while it's up to the old classic Trek, TNG era, to save the day with classic ships even. Uh, yeah. So we, we were talking about that. that. I mentioned that earlier. That's, I knew I'd seen yeah. it somewhere. I couldn't remember where. <laughs> also, we are in full retcon of Picard season two. Where are the Gerardi Borg? Down the memory hole. So also something we talked about. So uh, thank you, everyone, for your feedback and uh, agreed on all of that. So uh, that'll do it this time. We'd like to take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create the secrets of Star Trek, including Christopher H., Lynn L., Kevin B., Lisa R., and Chris G. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue the secrets of Star Trek in all the shows at StarQuest. And you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. So that's it from us. We would love to hear any of your feedback on Vox or the upcoming next final climactic episode. You can let us know by commenting on the show at sqpn.com slash Trek, our Facebook page at facebook.com slash StarQuest Media. You can send an email to Trek at sqpn.com or visit our Discord community at sqpn.com slash Discord. You can watch us on the secrets of star trek in video on our youtube channel at youtube.com slash starquest media and leave a comment there as well we'll be back next time when we'll be discussing the final episode of season three of star trek picard which interestingly we don't have a title of that episode yet yeah. so just that unlike the rest of the season yeah until then father Corey stika thank you for joining me and sharing the secrets of star trek thank you dom and once again, I'm Don Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to The Secrets of Star Trek on StarQuest. And remember, happy Frontier Day, everyone!